Good morning. I am Councilman Rory Lantzman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and today we are here to discuss the multi-agency responses to community hotspots, or MARCH, operations led by the NYPD and Council Member Levin's reporting bill, Intro 1156. March operations were originally established by former Mayor Rudy Giuliani. They are multi-agency raids where agencies such as the FDNY, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, State Liquor Authority, Department of Environmental Protection, and Department of Buildings <clears throat> enter a nightlife establishment, ask patrons to leave, and proceed to inspect venues. During the inspection, each agency can issue citations, fines, and summonses. March raids were originally begun during the Giuliani administration as a way to enforce the cabaret laws during the height of broken windows policing. Since the council repealed the cabaret laws and established the Office of Nightlife in 2017 to more effectively and fairly regulate these businesses, March raids deserve more scrutiny. There are serious and reasonable safety concerns for the patrons of nightlife venues, particularly those that occupy a previously industrial space or exist only for a night. These operations place a tremendous burden on small businesses already struggling to survive. Raids regularly shutter a business during peak weekend hours without notice, often without leading to any citations at all. In theory, these raids are driven by 311 complaints about quality of life issues, such as noise, incidents that occurred in the venue or the surrounding area, and cooperation with authorities. The data shows that March raids occur more regularly in minority communities or at venues frequented by minority patrons without regard to complaints or crime and even when business owners have gone out of their way to cooperate. Certainly the number of March raids in a community is not related to the number of establishments or the number of liquor licenses. Otherwise the Upper East Side would have more raids than Washington Heights rather than a third as many. The city has a responsibility to determine whether a business is violating building, fire, or health codes or violating the law. But from 2012 to 2017, 48% of raids resulted in no enforcement action by any agency. Council Member Levin's bill will help us evaluate the efficacy of these raids by giving us more detailed information about the triggers for March raids, how they are conducted, and how often they result in citations or fines. I look forward to hearing today from the administration advocates and business owners about March operations. With that, um, our first panel of witnesses are from the administration. If you all would raise your right hand, be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Good. Um, have you decided amongst yourselves who would like to go first? Good morning, Chair Lanceman and member of the council. I'm Assistant Deputy Commissioner Robert Messner, the commanding officer of the department's Civil Enforcement Unit. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, I am pleased to testify about the bill being heard today and the department's role in the multi-agency response to community hotspots or MARCH program. New York City is the largest, most diverse, most vibrant, and most exciting city in the nation. New York has always been the trendsetter in hospitality, entertainment, music, dance, and fashion, and this energy draws individuals of all ages from around the country and the world to enjoy and take part in our unparalleled nightlife. Such a vibrant and eclectic nightlife does, however, present unique challenges in a densely populated city where nightlife venues often exist side by side with residential properties. This often requires new and innovative approaches to meet these challenges by ensuring that a night out remon remains fun and safe while respecting the right of others to enjoy the peace and tranquility of their homes. The March program was introduced to address nightlife locations where chronic safety and crime conditions had been allowed to fester and other efforts had failed to address these conditions. The program is a collaborative effort with the NYPD providing security for agencies such as health, buildings, fire, the Department of Environmental Protection, and the State Liquor Authority while they perform inspections and take enforcement if needed. 
Let me take a moment to take you through how a typical march operation is coordinated and executed. The special operation lieutenant of each precinct is tasked with maintaining a list of SLA licensed establishments in the confines of their precinct and keeps track of 311 complaints, so long as they're relayed to the department, 911 calls, criminal complaints, and arrests stemming from these locations. In addition, neighborhood coordination officers, or NCOs, may become aware of a previously unreported issue while talking to community members and during conferrals with both the community boards and the precinct community councils. After the department confirms that we have received complaints from multiple complainants that conditions are tied to a specific establishment, we make the establishment aware of these conditions. This is done with the hope that the establishment will take necessary steps to address the issues and there will therefore be no need to include it in a march operation. If, however, the location refuses to address conditions stemming from their establishment, the location is rightfully considered for inclusion in such an operation. Prior to recommending a location for a march operation, both the precinct NCO and crime prevention officer consider methods of mediating the situation without the need for enforcement. In fact, crime prevention officers are mandated to visit all licensed premises in the precinct to ensure that they are provided with relevant crime prevention information and materials. This reflects the mayor's and police commissioner's commitment to neighborhood policing and an emphasis on collaboration and problem solving rather than simply increased enforcement. Indeed, the number of march operations has steadily declined from 117 in 2013 to 57 last year. If mediation and collaborative problem solving is successful, then a march operation will not be conducted. However, there are instances where the establishment will not work with the precinct to remediate the condition or take steps on their own. In these situations, personnel in the precinct, including the NCO, the field intelligence officer, or the crime prevention officer, may determine that an establishment is a candidate for a march operation. This recommendation is forwarded to the precinct's commanding officer. If the commanding officer agrees that the location warrants inclusion in a march operation, the commanding officer includes the location on a list of such locations in a written request for approval to the chief of patrol. These recommendations are made based upon many factors, including but not limited to 311 and 911 calls complaining about the conduct of the establishment, conferrals with both the community boards and the precinct community councils, meetings held with operators of the location, and crimes which have occurred in or around the location. It is significant to note that commanding officers are directed to consider only verified 311, 911, and community complaints relating to noise, underage drinking, quality of life violations, and drug sales or other violations when making this decision. Additionally, commanding officers are directed not to consider complaints of grand or pettit larceny or identity theft within the establishment if the establishment cooperated with the department in preventing future crime and plays no active role in the criminal activity. Once a list of recommended establishments is forward to the Chief of Patrol's office, they make the final determination of which locations will be included in the march operation after ensuring sufficient steps were previously taken to address problematic conditions without success. Once each location is approved for inclusion in a march operation, my unit, the Civil Enforcement Unit, will then schedule the operation. We ensure the availability of the other agencies and that they have the information that they need to effectively participate in the operation. Operations are usually scheduled for either Friday or Saturday evening, as some locations only operate on these nights, and these are the times when the agency's inspectors can get a realistic view 
of how a location operates during the times that give rise to most complaints and dangerous conditions. One benefit of the program is that it enables some of these agencies to conduct needed inspections when they would not otherwise be able to because the location may only operate at night or the inspector's safety could not otherwise be ensured. On the evening of the march operation, the agencies taking part meet at the relevant precinct to coordinate. The participating agencies and the precinct personnel then travel together to each location. Upon arrival, inspectors from each agency enter the location and begin their work. Barring a significant safety concern, such as severe overcrowding, noise levels that make communication impossible, or blocked fire exits, a location is allowed to operate without interference while the inspectors are being conducted. It has been our experience that most patrons shrug off the operation while a few ask questions of the city personnel involved. All then return to enjoying their night out, continuing on with their conversations and social activities. Patrons are not asked to leave the location or stop any activities during the inspections. As the commissioner has said, each day we strive to do better, and the same is true for March operations. We continually, continually review this program to ensure it is conducted in a manner that meets the needs of the city. For years, the department has held quarterly nightlife meetings with nightlife business owners and operators. These meetings are designed to keep the lines of communication open between these businesses and the department. Nightlife business owners and operators are encouraged to attend these meetings and voice their concerns to senior patrol borough police commanders. The department has also worked closely with the New York City Hospitality Alliance for over 10 years. This ongoing partnership has resulted in a robust and productive working relationship and has resulted in the cooperative publication of three editions of a booklet entitled Best Practices for Nightlife Establishments, which was written collaboratively by New York City Hospitality Alliance nightlife experts and police department law enforcement experts. The goal of this booklet is to help nightlife business operators to provide a safe and enjoyable experience for their customers and the surrounding community. This Hospitality Alliance NYPD partnership also produced an active shooter video which specifically dealt with nightlife venues. Recent tragedies such as the Pulse nightclub shooting mandate that we address the fact that nightlife establishments attract large numbers of people and have historically been the targets of individuals seeking to carry out sensational terrorist attacks. Last year, the mayor appointed the city's first nightlife mayor to head up the newly newly created Office of Nightlife, which is tasked with coordinating nightlife venues, city agencies, and the community to help the industry prosper safely in a way that benefits all New Yorkers. In fact, beginning last year, the Office of Nightlife conducted a citywide listening tour, which involved the department and representatives from other agencies to gather input and suggestions from businesses and the community to further this goal. The department looks forward to continuing our collaborative efforts with the Office of Nightlife, the New York City Hospitality Alliance, our sister agencies, and the community at large so that we can maintain a thriving and above all, safe nightlife environment. I will now turn my attention to intro 1156. The department has partnered with the council on dozens of pieces of legislation aimed at increasing transparency in the past, and this is no exception. Some of the criticism of these operations is driven by a lack of information, and we will work with the council to ensure more data is made public. Thank you for the opportunity to provide insight on these important operations, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Is anyone else testifying or just being available to respond to questions? Okay, good. So um, let's talk about how uh, establishments are identified for a, a march uh, operation. It, from your testimony and, and from the operations order, it seems like there's a detailed 
vetting, although a, a very high reliance on 311 and, and 911 complaints. But as a council member representing a district where I get complaints about uh, bars or other establishments that might be um, causing problems in the neighborhood, whether it's noise or, or patrons congregating um, outside, um, I'm not I'm unsympathetic to the, the need to identify establishments that are either unsafe for the patrons or causing community um, issues. The um, New York City uh, Artists Coalition did a, a Freedom of Information Law request and compiled data, I think, from 2012 to 2017 that mapped out where these um, raids are, are taking place and their results. So I want to ask you about the first finding, which is that, um, and I think it's in 48% of, uh, of these raids, no enforcement action is taken. Do you dispute that data? And um, uh, what can you tell us about how often it is that these raids result in, in, in enforcement action? Well, I do dispute that, and I believe that it's a much lower percentage. I think that the, one of the problems in trying to assess what's gone on before is that march operations, the term march operation is thrown around very loosely. It's like scotch tape. People refer to scotch tape but Scotch tape is really only a product made by the Scotch Corporation, but there are other cellophane tapes. It seems that every time a couple city inspectors get together and visit a nightlife business, people call that a march operation, and it's not. March operations are a very discreet thing. It's a collaboration. I'm with you. It's a collaboration between multiple city agencies that is approved, and I'm sure we'll end up talking about the approval process, and only 58 of them occurred last year. Now, I, I'm familiar to some extent with the study, and I know that they, part of the study, they produced a heat map. And the heat map purports to show the march, where the march operations occurred. Well, on their heat map, they, they say that, uh, between 68 and 104 operations occurred in the Rockaways. But I know that between 2013 to 2018, only seven March operations occurred in the Rockaways. And that of those, in those seven March operations, there were only 30 establishments that were approved for inclusion. And I also know that we never reach all the businesses that are approved for inclusion because of time constraints in the evening. So less than 30 places were visited. So just to, just, uh, just, just to clarify, so a march operation is, is, is broader than just we're going to one place. A mar one, one march operation could be 10, 20, 30. No. On a mar it, well, it's multiple march operations, and I'm sure we'll get into this, involve an approved list of places. The lists are typically four to six nightlife businesses in a single precinct. However, because of the time constraints of the agency inspectors, we n rarely, if ever, visit all four to six during the course of an evening. So typically, I would say the average number is three to four are visited during the course of an evening. They're typically in the same precinct, although sometimes we'll cross a precinct boundary. So with that understanding, just go back to, you were comparing, for example, the Rockaways. Right, what well, the, the reason- The coalition put together from the documents that they foiled, I mean, they, this wasn't my understanding, they're gonna testify later, this wasn't them just going out and sort of anecdotally finding out what happened, but. What, what do you understand the difference between your data is and their data, just well, so we're on the same page? The heat, yeah, I, I've never reviewed their data. I've looked at the heat map. The heat map shows there are two zones in the Rockaways. One of the zones appears to show 44 to 58 march operations. 
and because they're banding their data, and the other appears to show 24 to 44 operations. I know, based on the records of the department, that there were only seven March operations conducted in the Rockaways in 13 to 18, and that there were 30, of those seven operations, there were 30 locations approved, but I know that all 30 weren't reached. Just, right, well, they just, they use the term raids, so I don't know, and we'll have the opportunity to hear from them whether they, they describe a raid as being a raid of an individual establishment or a march operation, what, what might be three or four. But let's just, for the sake of the data that, that, that you agree with and that you presenting to us, of, of the establishments that were um, uh, the subject of these march raids, would you say about, about 30 or so? Council member, if, yes. if I could just, I, I kind of, I should say this at the outset because we're, uh, I noticed even in your testimony, we're calling them march operations and then we're going and calling them raids. Mm -hmm. uh, we would not categorize a march operation as a raid. I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to know what, what's envisioned, you know, when we use the term raid or when you use the term raid, what do you envision happening at one of these operations? I think that it's, and the coalition will testify for themselves, but from my own mind, the operation and, and, and the, word, the word operation and the word raid are, are interchangeable. What I mean is that the law enforcement agencies are visiting an establishment to determine their compliance with various and sundry laws. So um, I, I that's, would, I that's would, what we talk I would agree with that. Okay. I would call that an operation. I mean, a raid, what I envision an, as a raid is guns drawn, bulletproof vests, and, okay. and barreling down the door, which clearly I think we both agree is not the case during a march operation. All right. Well, I, I'm not suggesting that it is, but I'm not prepared to say that it isn't. So let's just use the word operation, and I we'll all be happy. That. Thank okay. you. So in the, the operations, how many, how many operations have there been, just your example, the Rockaways, in, in the time period that you were talking about? Since? Of, sorry, of individual businesses. Well, the most there could, most individual businesses that could have been visited in that period 2013 to the end of 2018, the most that could have been visited are 30. Okay. okay. Of, of those 30, or since you're estimating, let's do it this way. How many March operations of individual businesses yielded no enforcement action? I don't know. Well, see, that's, that's a big question. I, I think, and to, your, to, the, to the point of the bill about, by Council Member Levin, we're not objecting to the bill. I mean, that's certainly data that we can capture moving forward with a greater accuracy so we could determine the answer to, to these questions, but what we can say is, without giving you precise data, that of the location that we visited, wherever they are, whether it's the Rockaways or somewhere else, it is frequent that there are locations that there is no enforcement, and then there are locations when there is enforcement. Thank you. But moving forward, I think that's data that we're gonna be tracking pursuant to this bill, and we have no objection to providing it. W would you agree that um, an operation that produces no enforcement action suggests that maybe uh, that operation should not have been conducted, uh, in, especially in light of the fact, which I think we're going to have testimony of testimony about um, later, that these operations do put a tremendous strain on those businesses? I, I don't feel that an operation that produces no results should not have been conducted any more than I think that if a police officer doesn't make an arrest during the course of a day that that somehow was a, a waste of his time. I think, I, think a better, I think a better analogy would be if a police officer is stopping and frisking someone and nothing is produced from that, it begs the question, well, why did that stop and frisk occur? And, but if, and in particular, if there's a lot of that, you walked into it, it's not my fault. <laughs> if, there's, if, if, if there's a lot of that, then it really questions 
in well, a policy? I think, I, think the, I think the analogy is, is that if uh, an officer fails to issue a summons, that doesn't mean there were no traffic laws broken that day. And I think that that's, that's the point we're making here, that yes, g given the protocols for including a location in a march operation, the, ball the uh, multiple layers of approval involved, what the chief of department has in front of him when he approves a location for the march operation is that one, there have been complaints or conditions identified, whether it be 311911 at build the block meetings, community council meetings, wherever, that residents of that neighborhood are bringing this location to our attention. The, the chief of patrol also sees that we have sent officers, whether it's neighborhood coordination officers, community affairs officer, or any officers, are visiting that location and trying to collaborate and resolve the conditions being raised. And when we're failing to do that, where the location doesn't want to address the complaints, and we're seeing these complaints materialize over and over again, that's when the location gets, gets, uh, gets included in a march operation. Now, the fact that we may show up on the day of the march operation in a location that has a propensity to serve underage uh, individuals alcohol doesn't seem to happen, uh, doesn't seem to have an underage person there that night, doesn't mean that they haven't served underage alcohol. So I, I think I wouldn't get to the conclusion that you're getting to, but there is a possibility that on the night of a march, when we go there, the conditions that residents have complained about over and over again, conditions that we've attempted to remediate with the establishment owners may not be present that day. That doesn't mean that those conditions are not present. Well, I think our friends from the coalition and maybe the, the businesses themselves will, will talk about um, what seems to be a very high rate of um, uh, of operations that don't produce enforcement action. And that does raise questions about the selection process, and it does raise questions about the, the worth of these operations, not ever, but in the, the scale that the department or the, that, that they're being um, conducted. And then in the context of uh, the other aspect, what you refer to as the heat map, <coughs> which seems to, to, to indicate a, a much greater activity in communities of color. Now we're, we're, we're looking at other um, you know, analogies where law enforcement in the city um, is spending a lot of time on enforcement activity in communities of color that, that are hard to justify. So, so, so do, you, do you disagree or dispute um, not just the specific data points that, that the coalition has produced from the FOIA request, but, but the essence of it, right? That <coughs> there is much more enforcement in minority communities, just, just enforcement activity. There's much more operation activity in minority communities than there are in white communities. So a, cu a couple of points. Um, yes, I would dispute that to start off with, but I, I think the numbers, it's worth putting them in context. There are approximately 12,000 licensed establishments for on-premise alcohol consumption in the city. I think it's 40 short of, of 12,000 or thereabouts. There have been 57 March operations last year. I mean, so the numbers aren't I mean, they're nominal compared. So I think what, what the numbers basically show is that the vast, vast, vast majority of, ni of nightlife establishments are actually good actors, abiding the law. Um, they're addressing their community's concerns. Uh, they're addressing our concerns when we bring those con community concerns to their attention. So I think it says a lot that the number of operations are 57, and I think I should also highlight that that number is about half of what it was when the mayor took office. So we were looking at approximately 109 or so operations in 2014. It was reduced to 57 operations last year. So they've steadily decreased over time. In terms of the concentration of operations, we're not seeing what, what, you're, what you're highlighting in this report. Now, I'm not sure where the data came from, 
Uh, I would like to see the data rather than the conclusions that were printed. I would like to see the actual data that was, uh, that was gained by this group. But what I can tell you is taking a look at 2018, uh, the March operations were pretty evenly spread out. So Manhattan South, for example, Patrol Borough Manhattan South, which is 59th Street and below, had nine March operations. Manhattan North, which is above 59th Street, had seven March operations. Patrol Borough Bronx, which is all of the Bronx, had seven operations. Uh, Patrol Borough Brooklyn South had nine. Patrol Borough Brooklyn North had eight. So, I mean, we're looking at the numbers are essentially even as you go across the city. Uh, I'm, I'm really not seeing the conclusions that that, that report has come to. I want to turn it over to my colleagues, in particular um, Council Member Levin, because it's his bill. Um, but if we wanted to, to, to arrange a meeting, you, the coalition, the council members who are interested, um, or our staff, and, and you can see their data and talk with them directly. H have you done that already? Yeah, so I think, uh, and the commissioner could, can go into it, but we have regular meetings with, with the Hospitality uh, Alliance. It's been going on for years. They're regular quarterly meetings. We took part in the listening tour as part of the creation. I understand. Of I mean, but the folks who, who, who got this data and, and produced this report, have I, you I'm, met with them? I'm not sure who the folks are. I mean, I'm, so uh, I can't really You'd be willing to, to meet with them. You said you sure. wanted to see the I would data. like to see the data first yep. to make it more a more productive meeting, but I have no problem doing All that. All right. I have a lot more questions, but uh, the, the bill sponsor is here and there are other members here. So Council Member Levin, let me just also say, We've also been joined by Councilmember Alan Maisel from uh, Brooklyn and Councilmember Andy King from the Bronx. Okay. Yeah. Andy Cohen. I do it all the time. I'm sorry. Um, thank you very much, <coughs> Chair. Uh, thank you all for your, for your testimony and for being here today. Um, I guess uh, going off of uh, your testimony, um, I just want to make it clear. So what exactly is the criteria? So if if there have been 50, if there were 57 March operations last year, um, certainly not every. I know how many SLA licenses are there? About 12,000. 12,000 on premise. So of those 12,000, I'm assuming that more than 57 had some 311 complaint about noise or about people standing outside. I mean, I could just think of. I represent Community Board One in Brooklyn. You know. People are smoking outside, get a 301 complaint. The music's too loud, get a 301 complaint. Um, uh, you know, that, that's pretty much across the board, I think. Um, I think it would actually be hard to find a nightlife establishment that doesn't have a 301 complaint. So then what criteria of all the universe of, uh, of nightlife establishments that have a variety of 301 complaints do we, did we use to, to, to choose these 57? Well, it's much more than 311 complaints. The, the process uh, is a process that tries to identify places that pose a variety of problems to the, to the surrounding community, but also, and probably more importantly, making sure that these are problems that the business is responsible for, that the business has not addressed, and that the business has been informed and of the problems and asked to address and not. In like other what kind words, of problems? These are enforcement resistant or in or places that have not taken appropriate steps to address. So you have three one one complaints, nine one one complaints. You have uh, issues brought to the neighborhood coordinating officers, the NCOs by local residents. You have community councils and you have community boards and a variety of other places. Uh, complaints can come in in many different ways and they can be for many different things. Mm -hmm. the, the neighborhood coordinating officers uh, are, are tasked with meeting with the owners and operators of local establishments and the community and the crime prevention officers in each precinct are so The NCO program is a newer program. Yes. It's only been around for a couple of years so obviously the March task force is, predates the NCO program. Well, but the crime prevention officers have, for many, many years, been required to keep a list of every licensed premise in the, that particular precinct and to meet with the owners and operators of that premise to talk to them about crime conditions, to provide them with 
crime prevention information. Okay, I just want to be clear. So is it related to crime or is it related to, to quality of life? Well, it's, it's both. Many, many places that get visited and that get included in a march operation uh, have violence problems. That's one of the most common. But we've heard from a, a, a lot of establishments that have had a march operation that didn't include a, they didn't have a history of, of, of violence. I mean, I, you know, I had an establishment in my district, I have a march operation, and it was, you know, it was kind of an unrelated Department of Buildings issue. Well, um, can, you know, that, so. Can I just say that uh, very often people will say that they've had a march operation, that they, a march operation was conducted in their premises when it isn't a, well, a I can march actually, operation. I, I, in this instance, this is how I found out what march was because the person told me I got visited by the cops, FDNY, uh, SLA, uh, DOB, uh, you know, maybe another agency all at the same time. And I said, that's uh, that's that's strange. I didn't know that that happened, and so that's how I found out what March was. So in fact, it was a March operation. I was able to confirm that. I'm just I'm just trying to figure out the criteria here because that wasn't a violent. There was no violence in that instance. Oh. It was it was literally it was a DOB. They didn't correct their DOB problem. They had a DOB problem. But I don't understand why that's a why that then involves you know a multi agency response. But I I mean I think. It's very hard for us to comment on a specific I'm not, location. I'm not asking about no, the I specific. I mean about a specific location. We can certainly look it up. We're highlighting there was uh, a DOB issue. We need to see more. I think under the under the the system that's in place, I think what we can tell you broadly across all locations is that whatever the complaints are, whatever the conditions are, crime conditions, what have you, mm -hmm. we make attempts for for the exception of an unlicensed premise, which I think you would you would agree with us that we shouldn't be making an attempt to have an unlicensed premise correct their behavior and continue operating unlicensed. But for a licensed premise, we make attempts to try to resolve this. And I think part of your earlier question about March predating uh, neighborhood policing, I think you're right, March does predate neighborhood policing, but important to see is neighborhood policing is about collaborative problem solving rather than enforcement. And what you're able to see with, with neighborhood policing being implemented, the number of march operations has been roughly cut in half. So that means we're reaching out to these business owners, we're trying to figure out a solution to whatever that condition is, whatever that complaint is, without resorting to a march operation. Okay, let me, let me ask this. Why, what is an, a march operation accomplishing that a visit from an inspector from these individual agencies wouldn't accomplish. There's, why, uh, you know, if there's an issue of people getting into fights at a bar outside, is it, is it better for, for there to be a, um, you know, uh, a, a, you call it a raid or you can call it an operation, but when it involves 15 or more people, you know, it's, it's, it's something. Why, why is this the right way to do this as opposed to um, the, being mu much more targeted in terms of addressing the issue? So say there's a, you know, one business has a, something that is kind of falls into the purview of FDNY. Why does an FDNY just go out? Why does it involve a multi-agency response where sometimes people are wearing, you know, it, tactical the gear? Couple answers. The, a, a location is not going to get included in a march operation because they have an FDNY problem. The complaints that come in are indicative usually of a range of problems, especially things like violence or underage or noise. And the important thing to remember is no one, no establishment gets included in a march operation unless they haven't made, they've been informed of this problem and haven't made the effort to address it. So once you have a location that has already demonstrated that they're not willing to address their problems, it, it's important for the city to try to determine what else aren't they doing. Every one of these locations is subject to uh, 
rules and regulations of multiple agencies. Well, if they're not willing to address their violence, are they also uh, going to be not keeping up their health code? Are they all going to have blocked fire exits? But why wouldn't, but the health code is something that like the health inspectors go out all the time to bars and restaurants on their own. And that doesn't take a, that doesn't take a, a, a multi-agency operation to figure out whether that there's a health violation. I, I think I, I, I would disagree because I think a lot, a lot of complaints are intertwined between and they cut across multiple agencies. So if you have a location that has a propensity to have violence or fights break out, right, doesn't it make sense to see if there are underage people there and are being served alcohol contributing to the fight? I mean, doesn't I, it make sense? But I, 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 like I, I would just I, like, I, to, fin I, just like sure, to finish. Sure. Doesn't it make sense to see if a location that invites large numbers of people, right, that has fights breaking out and the propensity for that, that they actually have their building code and fire exits free. What if there's a surge of people? Does it make sense to make sure that they have a, a, a means of egress and ingress, or a means to escape a potentially violent incident? I mean, again, and we keep harping on this because it's important to harp on this, a location that has one fight is not going to get a march operation. A location that has multiple fights and are refusing to take any action to stop that activity from happening is going to have a march operation. And all of the agencies that come to the march operation are relevant to the march operation. So is every, because you said, you mentioned three examples. You said violence, underage drinking, and noise. Um, does every March operation involve violence? No. No, right? So, so, you know, how many, I mean, how many bars have, have examples of underage drinking? I mean, people, that's, to, to say I, that, to I say that, that, to say, that, to say that uh, underage drinking is a criteria or noise. I mean, noise is a very, again, the underage drinking and noise are two things that I think are much more uh, uh, prevalent than any of us would like in New York City, but, to say that there's a, a noise complaints, or a persistent noise complaints is a reason for a march, or multiple instances of, of, of underage drinking. But again, those are things that, that NYPD does without a full scale, you know, without a, without a multi-agency operation. To, 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 to bust somebody for underage drinking uh, is, I think, part, you know, that, that's something that NYPD PD has done for a long time in a way that is, um, does it involve like a multi-agency raid or whatever? Council member, I think you're coming to you're coming to a conclusion that just because these agencies are present, that all of them are taking enforcement, and that's just not the case. So it it could very well be the case. Everybody's going out on the operation. A location that has uh, a noise issue, for argument's sake, mm -hmm. fire department may not issue a single summons. Building department may not issue a single summons. The police, the SLA may not issue a single summons, but the EP may very well issue a summons at that location. The idea is, is that all of the stakeholders are present and we could address whatever conditions we see. And oftentimes, a lot of these establishments aren't open during the week. They're open on the weekends, at night. So the, a lot of the stakeholders here don't have the opportunity uh, to visit them. And here is the opportunity uh, that's targeted precisely at locations that are refusing to collaborate or address the conditions that the communities are highlighting in any way, and all of the stakeholders are going to be present, and to the extent that they're needed, they're going to they're going to participate. To the extent that they're not needed, they're not going to issue, they're not going to take any enforcement action. Um, what is the what is the, uh, you mentioned a little bit in your testimony, but what is the exact procedure then for uh, for conducting one of these? It, it is who who you, the final approval comes from your office? Is that right? No, final approval comes from the chief of patrol's office. the The operation starts with uh, the NCO or the crime prevention officer uh, becoming aware of a problem or some other officer at, in the precinct becoming aware of a problem and they start to talk among each other and if they realize that this seems to be an ongoing issue they're tasked with telling the location. 
The NCOs, that's part of their job description. The crime prevention officer, as I said, they're required to keep a list of all businesses, visit them, make sure they have all relevant information. If those officers feel that there's no opportunity, there's no been no action on the part of the establishment to try to remediate, then they can go to uh, the special operations lieutenant, the field intelligence officer, and ask for more information about this place. If all agree that, or any of them feel that this place should be included on a march operation, they can go to their commanding officer. They recommend to the commanding officer inclusion of this location on a march because they've been informed of the issues and they haven't addressed them. The commanding officer reviews that. If he or she feels that the place does belong on a march because they have a type of problems or problem, problems that are appropriate for inclusion the command, and that they've been informed and haven't done anything, the commanding officer is going to include them that location on a list of four to six locations in the precinct and send that to the chief of patrol's office. The chief of patrol's office is then going to review those locations and the chief of patrol's office is going to look first, is this the, are these the type of problems that should be included in a march operation and second, has the business been given the opportunity to address these? The chief of patrol approves some locations and denies other locations, says no, either it's not the type, right type of problems or you haven't done enough to remediate with the operators. The ones that are approved, they approve the operation, then it comes to my unit, the civil enforcement unit. We schedule with the other agencies. Many of the other agencies need to know the businesses the identities of the place we're going to visit beforehand so that they can do their internal research. They need to know the building plans. They need to know what type of, of liquor license they have. So we tell them the locations beforehand so they can do their research. The night of the operation, we gather at the precinct, and then we go out together. Um, Mock J has a task force, a task force on special enforcement um, that targets uh, problematic or illegal bars and gambling rings and such. Um, why is this, why is that not a sufficient um, uh, tool to address issues that you're, that, that the March task force is looking to address? I, I wouldn't try to answer for Mock J. I'm really not sure. Are you familiar with, of with their that operation. task force? Excuse me? Are you familiar with that task force? Uh, not really. I, I know that, you know, Mock J has enforcement efforts, but I'm not familiar with what they're uh, doing specifically on this. Um, I'm still a little unclear as to why this is necessary. I, 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 um, I don't understand why individual agencies who have inspectors that FDNY has inspectors, they can visit any establishment at any time. DOHMH has inspectors, they can go there, and they do you know, many more than 15, 57 times in a year. Why, I don't understand, why is that protocol, which businesses are aware of, that there's some level of normal course of, of, of action, you know, it's, it's, it's within the kind of normal realm of an, a business's interaction with city agencies. Why is that not sufficient? And, and what has been demonstrated in, say, the 57 cases last year to show why, that, why normal uh, uh, individual agency visits by inspectors would be e insufficient? I mean, it's not, and it, just keep in mind, uh, DOHMH has inspectors that could go out at 10 o'clock on a Saturday, too. It's not as if that's impossible. Well, several things. DOH Individual agencies, many of the individual agencies often do not work at night routinely. The, whereas in most of these establishments that get visited in March operations, the problems tend to be at night. So if inspectors are going out and inspecting nightlife businesses when they're not open for business, that 
doesn't give them a true understanding of the conditions that actually exist in the business. But my understanding, sir, is that, is that they do have, both agencies or all the agencies, they all have inspectors that will go out at night. I mean, I can ask them, does oh, FDNY I'll, or DOHMH have speak. inspectors that go out at night? Yes, they do. Yeah. I can also confirm for the health department that we have an email. <laughs> the, the collaborative methodology of agencies collaborating to address complex problems is one that's really been used very successfully in this administration. You can look at the uh, opioid task force. You can look at the efforts that my office led against K2. I, I know that you yes, were sure. very involved in that. And what we needed because of the, the shortfalls of the state legislature legislation which didn't make K2 illegal for many years when people in the city were becoming victimized and sickened by it, what we needed then was a multi-agency approach and that's what we used. The multi-agency approach, the collaborative approach, is a sound one because it is an appropriate use of city resources. For many years prior to this administration, city agencies were, us were uh, very often properly criticized for wasting resources by working in silos. We're trying not to work in silos. We're trying to find places that aren't responding to our telling them that they have issues that they have to address and are refusing to address them. Those are places that deserve to be inspected. If they're not willing to address the problems that we're specifically telling them exist, then what else aren't they? willing to address. Well, that's something that we could, I mean, for one thing, I, 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 comparing, you know, uh, a bar or a restaurant, some of whom I've, I'm familiar with uh, that I know of that have had March operations to the K2 epidemic, I, I agree, the K2 epidemic does deserve a, a multi-agency response. I mean, well, the K2 the, epidemic that's needed. The, this is, this is, I mean, it's not even apples and oranges, that's, this is, um, I, I, you know, dis this, I disagree, and I'll tell you why. The K2 I, epidemic was a law shortfall, okay? That's different than this. There weren't laws, but what's similar to this is, you know, we all remember Happy Land, and we, Happy Land where multiple people died because a club only had one method of entrance and egress, and when a fire was started that blocked it, all those people died. But again, that's we also know about the Pulse nightclub shooting, where Again, if we, if they had had, if they'd been up to code, if they had had the active shooter plans that we encourage businesses to make, then those people might not have died. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I, just, I, I don't find that funny. No, no, no. Well, I, I think, I think, I think what you're seeing is a reaction because it's to say that to say that we're. The, 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 the city is doing march operations to protect, to protect, you know, that all these are to protect these establishments from potential shooting incidents. I don't, I don't know if that's really accurate. Well, I, I mean, council member, the department's collaborating with the nightlife industry in general. We, we, with the um, hospitality alliance specifically, we develop uh, sh active shooter scenarios, but that's not the issue here. What the issue here is, is what are the proper tools to use to address community complaints, crime conditions that we're seeing that we're unable to address on a collaborative basis with the actual establishment itself after trying to do so. And what, you're, what you seem to have an issue with is a tool that the department uses to do that. I mean, you may not agree with that tool. I would argue that there are constituents that actually do agree with that tool because they expect us to do something. And when collaborating and when working with the establishment fails to work, we escalate it to the next tool. We look at all of the available tools. This is one of those available tools. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Thanks. Council Member Cohen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to be clear that I, uh, I understand what we're talking. How many rate operations did you say there were in uh, uh, 2017? 
in, in, in 17 or 18? In 17 or 18. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I heard you testify, I think, to one year. I wasn't sure which yeah, year. Yeah, we were saying in 18, there were 57. If you, it's 17, if you want to look at that one, there were 68 operations. So we were down 11 operations from 17 to 18. And in 2016, there were uh, 77 operations. So if you take a look at it, they're decreasing. If you look at it from the beginning of the administration in 2014, there were 109. So if you look at 2018, where we have 57, we're roughly, we roughly cut the number of these operations in half. Uh, and I would, I would say in large part due to the protocols that were instituted, that we're actually trying to engage with the business to resolve what the basis of the complaint is. And 57 raids, uh, I ran for office because I thought there'd be no math, but that's, uh, you, the, uh, you, uh, you conduct these operations on half a percent of all uh, facilities that have a liquor license? No, no, no. Well, well yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> I, I'm, it's, so it's, it's not 57 establishments, it's 57 operations. So as the commissioner testified, each operation has somewhere between four to six establishments, and that's not saying that we're actually gonna go to each one of those because inevitably what happens at the end of at the end of um, the, the number. inevitably what happens at the end of the night or during the course of the night, we we'll recognize I'm sorry, we'll that conduct we're multiple short operations in a single night. Excuse no. no, no, no. It's one operation. Okay. Each operation that's approved has somewhere, as the commissioner said, in the neighborhood of four to six establishments. That's the operation. Today, we're going to visit four to six establishments, and that counts as one operation. Now, we generally don't get to the four to six, as he testified, because of time constraints during the course of the night. There may be issues in one, another one may be can, closed. Can you tell me how many, in 2018, how many uh, locations were subject of an operation? How many bars, restaurants, or nightclubs? In 20, well, okay. that's the number that was approved, okay. but so, not visited. In 2018, there were 203 locations that were approved. Now, I, I want to, but I, I need to explain this because it's important. 203 locations that were approved by the Chief of Patrol to be part of a march operation. Now, that does not mean that 203 locations were actually visited, and then there's another qualifier to this. As we said, during the course of the night, we run short on time and we may not visit a, lo a location or two locations that are on the list. That location may be re-included in some subsequent, so there's some I, double I counting. Can you there. tell me, though, in 2018, how many locations you actually did uh, operate in? You approved 203, you didn't get to yeah, all no, 203? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can't. I, I can't with accuracy, I can't. Uh, I can tell you that the maximum we could have done in 2018 was 203 out of 12,000 licensed establishments. We're talking about 203 that were approved. We know we didn't get to all 203, and we certainly know that some of that 203 are double counts because whatever we couldn't get to, they were included in the subsequent list. So. The universe we're looking at is 203 approved, and the number we actually visited is somewhere less than that. But I think, again, to, to my point earlier, I think Council Member Levin's bill is going to get us to, to get to that data with some level of specificity, which is why we're not opposing uh, providing that data moving No, I, I can't see any reason to uh, uh, oppose the bill. I'm not, you know, I haven't heard from any of the uh, uh, business owners uh, who have been subject to one of these operations, but I, I can't see uh, an objection to uh, reporting. I can think of a facility in my district that maybe could be could use one of these, honestly. Um, but it, it's ultimately, I guess the answer is even at, you know 120 is one percent. It's a very small percentage of. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Council Member Levin, did you want to go back to anything? I I just, I just thought you might have yielded because Councilmember Cohen had to uh, had to go. Um, Not required. Uh, well, just I, I, uh, the, in terms of of the follow up to a march 
operation. Uh, so we've heard that, um, you know, example of one establishment got 18 summonses during uh, an operation that were all dismissed when the owner went to court. Um, but, you know, there's, owners sometimes will feel, you know, that, that can you speak a little bit to that, to, to, to the follow-up and what happens uh, subsequent to this operation? Is it, is there any kind of ongoing communication with these agencies? Um, I mean, we've also heard, frankly, that um, some businesses are being told, you know, if, if you cooperate with us, we'll take it easy on you, or, um, you know, there's, there's, it's a little, a little bit unclear. I think sometimes owners get the perception or get the feeling that, um, uh, that the purpose of this is to kind of uh, intimidate businesses or, uh, you know, try to put down a marker uh, if you, you know, if, if, you, if, if you're not, if you don't work with us, there's going to be um, you know, ongoing problems. So the, I, I would certainly not characterize it that way because the reality of it is if the condition is, is resolved, there is no need for a march operation. And, and I'll, I'll kind of take it a step further. So let's, let's assume we have complaints or conditions that are brought to the department's attention. We're going to send officers or the neighborhood coordinating officer over to try to work collaboratively to resolve the problem. Let's assume the establishment says, you know what, I don't want to work with you. But then they go on and resolve the problem on their own. That place will not be mm -hmm. recommended for a march operation. They don't need to cooperate with us. What they actually need to do is address the conditions that are being raised, address the complaints that are being raised. It could be with us, it can be without us, but the end result is it's about the end, not the means of getting there. So th I think that's the best way to answer that. Do, does, does the March Task Force or the NYPD um, factor in what kind of music an establishment plays? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's Absolutely not. A, not. Okay. And you, you've, you've, have you ever heard a complaint that that has happened, or I mean, has anyone ever said uh, you know that they, they felt like they were targeted for the type of music that they? No, and and real realistically, if if that's the complaint that a club is playing a particular kind of music and you know that's bothering us if that's the complaint that's coming in not only would it not be approved by the chief of patrol it wouldn't be recommended by the lowest level mm -hmm. you know in the process which is the nco or the fio or any of them it, that's just not a basis right. for a march um okay i just i want i i'm still very skeptical that there's a need for this type of enforcement um and Particularly when there's no, when there's no report or instance of of violence taking place, um, uh, you know I don't I don't understand why um, the vast majority of these operations could not be addressed through the normal channels of enforcement, um, which uh, again businesses um, you know are aware of. I mean part of this is that. This comes, you know, if this, if 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 you have a multi-agency response showing up at uh, at 10:30 on a Friday, um, that's a very unnerving, rattling um, uh, interaction with, you know, with with the city. If you don't have any instance, if you just have, you know, if it's based on noise complaints or somebody, um, you know, reported, you know, reported underage drinking or something like that, um, which, you know. Frankly, I imagine is is much more prevalent, I, I, you know, than any of us would want to acknowledge. I mean, I think that, that that's the kind of thing that it probably happens. If if that was the case, you know, then uh, there would probably be a lot more. If it was for every underage drinking uh, instance, I imagine that like a lot of bars in Manhattan would would you'd have a lot more march raids in Manhattan than than you do, um, if that were the criteria. Well, so I think I think. I think that's why what we're saying is this is a tool of, of last resort. It's not the primary go-to tool. It doesn't prohibit any one agency or multiple agencies from visiting the location on their own in the normal course of their functions. It, that one thing doesn't have anything to do with another. I think, I think at the end of the day, as we've mentioned, it's, it's a system that's been, uh, the use of which has been greatly reduced over the years. 
57 operations over the course of the year is, mm -hmm. is very low, I would argue. If you look at the number of locations visited compared to the number of licenses issued, 12,000 licenses issued under 200 locations visited, I think you would agree that that's a very low number that we, I, I would argue that it is not abused. It's actually used as a precision tool to address complaints, conditions that where other means to address it have failed. And sorry, my last question is for FDNY actually is, uh, is, there, is there a difference between uh, the types of violations, the amount of violations that FDNY gives out during a March operation than what they would normally give out during a, a normal inspection? And I guess that question could go for DOHMH as well. Uh, no, there is no difference between the type of violation that we issued during the March operation or any type that we do inspection. Um, okay. I, I, we've heard some reports that, that that may not be the case. So uh, if we hear that in the testimony or in written testimony, we'll certainly communicate that with you. Okay. Uh, similar to Health Department, uh, we don't track quantitatively uh, statistics on March operations and the inspection results from that. Um, but we do ask, we're asked to participate to ensure that establishments are properly permitted. They meet the food, food establishment sanitary requirements um, and uphold provisions of the Smoke-Free Air Act. Um, and these inspections, uh, we, we don't, I don't believe that we see a, a difference in the violations that we issue. And sorry, Mr. Chair, one last question. If, does each operation is just a very, is, is one, is, I mean, I'll just use RAID as a, as a, the specific instance. Is the operation a specific instance or is an operation, like in other words, is a, can a March operation include multiple establishments on the same it night? It does. It does. It does. So okay. one, one operation, the commissioner testified, is okay. four oh. to six establishments. I see. Up to four to roughly, on average, four to six establishments and that we don't actually get to visit all four to six because of time constraints. I see, I during see, the okay. Of the okay. So, so there's some, so 57 is the number of operations, but the number of establishments visited by the MART task force may be higher than that. Correct. Well, that, that's why the numbers I'm, I'm giving you is, and to put it into context, is out of 12,000 roughly mm -hmm. licensed establishments, we visited less than 200 in 2018. Okay. So Got that's it. the 57 operation equates to less than 200 establishments issued. So that's 2%? So two, uh, like a little less than 2%? Uh, less than 2%. 1.8% yeah. something like that? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you very much for your time. This might have been asked, but, but what is the role of the, uh, the new nightmare in, in all of this? And are there times where the, that office has been invited uh, to try to mediate uh, uh, um, or address problems or concerns that, that might be presented to, to the various agencies before the, the March operation is conducted? I mean, I can't speak in great detail about the, about the functions of, of the nightlife mayor, but what I can tell you is that when the office came, uh, came to be, uh, the police department as well as other agencies participated in a listening tour across the boroughs uh, with, nightlife, uh, with nightlife establishments. And uh, my understanding is, is that, you know, the role involves a regular liaison with establishments that operate throughout the city. Uh, any concerns that they may raise, not only relative to March operations. Right, but, but do, you know, do you know if the department has ever taken the, uh, the complaints and concerns and issues that it has and prior to doing a march operation at a given establishment said, let's call the office of the nightmare and see if you know, they can work it out. I mean, I can't, I really can't say either way. I can't say that we haven't, but I can't say that we have, but I can look into it. I, I know the person that was part of the listening tour that went around that, that has a regular means of communication. So after the hearing, I'll reach out to that individual and ask. And in, ask. The, um, in the patrol guide order that, that gives the, 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 the guidelines for conducting these operations, maybe it'd be a good idea to add mm -hmm. a paragraph about, and prior to an operation consultation with the nightmare, just looking for ways to try to solve problems. I'm a council member, again, my district, we've got problems with some locations. We want the problem solved in the fastest way possible. It'll be good for everybody. 
Um, well, that's all the questions that I have for you all. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. It, I know that it would be appreciated by the other witnesses if you would maybe hang around and hear what they've got to say, and I would appreciate it uh, also. So if you have the time. Sure. We'll leave a representative from the department right. behind. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel, uh, Rob Bookman from the New York Hospitality Alliance, Olympia Kazi from the New York City Artists Coalition, Maria Babchi, sorry if I'm spelling that, saying that wrong, um, a, a proprietor of an establishment, um, Diana Mora from Friends and Lovers, and Rachel Nelson, a small business owner or representative. Did you say Bakchi? Maybe Babel. Yes. <laughs> Marva. <laughs> They're going to bring this way. <laughs> Do you want us to start? <laughs> Just, do we have written testimony from all of I have written testimony from the New York City Artists Coalition. Does anyone else have written testimony? Here? Oh, okay, they're, they're, they're gathering it up. All right, um, let's get you sworn in and get started. So could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? We do. Thank you. Um, is there any particular order that you'd like to go in? You seem, you seem ready start. to go. Yes. <laughs> right. We are going to put the clock on five minutes. Thank you. No requirement that you use the whole five. <laughs> and. Uh, just identify yourself and get started. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Olympia Kaja and I'm a member of the New York City Artist Coalition. The first time I heard about these multi-agency raids in the middle of the night and how they target venues with an avalanche of fines, even for things that uh, the agents themselves have said they wouldn't hold in court, was in the founding meeting of the coalition. We were coming together in the aftermath of the gossip tragedy where lives were lost in the pursuit of experiencing community and creative expression. Since then, our small group of volunteers is working to ensure the safety and the very existence of informal artists and community-driven grassroots cultural spaces in New York City. Intro 1156 is the result of our advocacy. We hope that this bill is a first step and that if these raids are proven as problematic and arbitrary as reports from our members have indicated that the city of New York will act and will put an end to these raids once and for all. NYPD sustains that these raids happen only at venues that have been flagged for patterns of serious illegal activity. They also claim that the raid is a last resort after they've reached out to the owners and staff. Unfortunately, the testimonies you'll hear today so otherwise. Raids happen to venues without having had any talks for that matter, without having had any problems with their local precinct or city agency inspectors. Raids were triggered with as little as a 311 noise complaint and a stolen phone. Nothing that really warrants a raid. There is an informal consensus that some precincts used such a raid to target businesses owned or, and or frequented by LGBTQ and people of color. We've heard reports of businesses being raided after refusing to consent to ask by enforcement agents that they were in the gray, gray area of civil rights. 
Through a freedom of information request, uh, we got some data for 2012 and 17, 2017, and uh, another testimony later will talk more in detail, and I can answer also to some questions, and they la shed light on some of the questions you asked earlier. Grassroots cultural spaces in our city are already under threat by the lack of affordability and of philanthropic and governmental support. All the work that we do to address those challenges by joining the Small Business Advocacy Platform and by collaborating with the Office of Nightlife and the Department of Cultural Affairs will be all for naught if we do not address this persistent threat of criminalization. What good will it be if we get SBJSA or even if we obtain commercial rent stabilization if operators have to live under the threat of constant, you know, disruptive rates that cause the loss of wage, job, and uh, exorbitant cost and fines, even to closure sometimes. Uh, those mystery multi-agency raids, some call them nightlife task force, others march, uh, NYPD, from what I understand today, they may call it something else as a whole, but basically there are many agencies showing up and they cause uh, this rupture. Palisades, a venue in Brooklyn that was featured in the New Yorker cover, would still exist today if it hadn't been marched. For all the venues that survived the raids, and you'll hear from some here today, they still had anyhow impacts and they uh, were stigmatized. Neighbors were awakened, patrons were forced to leave, landlords were alerted. People presume that something is seriously wrong if you are raided. So the criminalization, shutdown, and loss of grassroots cultural spaces pushes our community farther underground into, into unsafe environments. So we really want to end that. So I have some line edits that I will submit in writing only. And in conclusion, I want to thank you, Chair Langman. I want to thank all our sponsors, Council Member Reynoso, Ampri Samuel R Rivera, and Rose, and especially, of course, the Council staff and Council Member uh, Levin and uh, Espinal for their leadership. We believe that enforcement must be fair, proportional, and transparent, and we need talks, not raids. Thank you. Under five minutes. <laughs> Uh, so you can read it and then you submit later. Okay, great. Um, I did write a testimony, but then I kind of changed it based on the information I heard earlier. Um, so apparently I'm in the 20th percentile. Of can you just move the, oh, thank you. Hi, the I'm red light I'm on? I'm Deanna Mora from Friends and Lovers okay. uh, in Crown Heights. So clearly I'm in the 20th percentile of these march marches, which I don't understand. I have, I'm in great standing with the community board um, the NCOs come weekly. I send them an email on a weekly basis with any issues that we may or may not have had. I also update them on security protocols. We now do pat-downs, uh, pay $3,000 to get HC cameras. Whatever they asked, I did, yet I still get marched. I've been marched on twice. I know I was told I was on the list before and they crossed my name off. Don't really understand how that's possible. The first time it happened, I had 25 men walk in in bulletproof uh, SWAT jackets at 2.45 in the morning. Not only was it intimidating, but it was, it, I thought I was getting arrested. And someone with severe anxiety, it really can send you over the edge. So not only did it affect my mental state, but it just affected the clientele and their perception of me. And my staff did not feel like they were in a safe environment. I had to have meetings to reassure them that we were okay. Um, $30,000 later, we still got raided last December. Um, it was such a drastic difference in how I was treated. The NCO shook my hand, said, don't worry, you're good, we'll be in and out in 15 minutes. Why was I still raided if I was good? They just raided the place at the corner, so we knew that they were bound to come to us. Why? Because why would they walk by us? Is my, that's how I perceive that. They were done in less than 10 minutes. We were not issued more than a small citation for, I don't really know actually, because I just received it in the mail and I didn't open it yet because I wasn't ready to stomach it this weekend. <laughs> Nonetheless, the point is transparency and, and the escalation plan. It's not apples to apples here. I'm not here, I did not hear a proper protocol that made sense to what my experience has been. So. Transparency would definitely help in facilitating the conversation with whoever is actually in charge because my NCO constantly just says, it's above my pay grade. I don't know what that means. So I just, I'm here to help. Thank you.
Hi. Uh, my name is Rachel Nelson. I own three bars in Brooklyn. I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, I made the mistake recently of renting a place that was on the naughty list. Uh, the naughty list means that you're open to more scrutiny than other places. A March raid comes arbitrarily, enforces laws that happen. The fire department was there once, they didn't enforce it. A March comes, they do enforce it. So the fact that they're saying the, the sort of fairy tale depiction of um, the city's representation is really a fairy tale of what happens. They come in in SWAT gear. They chase away your customers, whether by actual chasing them out or by the fact that they're there in SWAT gear. Um, they basically intimidate you, and the, the goal, I believe, is actually to intimidate you out of business. This isn't a small thing. This isn't, this isn't a thing that should happen in a democracy. There are agencies, there's a fire department, there's a Department of Health. As uh, Councilman Levin said, all of these people come and they come regularly. You're open to so much scrutiny. Having a liquor license opens you up to scrutiny from things that you didn't even know existed before you had a liquor license. So I'm, in, uh, good I'm on good terms with my NCO as well. And again, I actually have a decent relationship with the precinct, but because the location I was at had gunfights 15 years ago, we continue to get more scrutiny as a place that now has white walls and art openings. We're a not-for-profit that runs a bar to try to support ourselves in the ever-expanding, expensive realm of New York City rents, compliance, and protocol. But there's no way for us to get out from under the reputation of the former tenant. Now, in a democracy, where is there room? Who do I call? And that's my biggest issue. Who do I call for March? What? There, if you Google March, there's no, there's no way to Google March. There's no directory in the city list of directories of, oh, here's March. Even when you call the fire department, there's, when you say, hey, can I speak to the office in charge of March? They can't tell you where that office is. They can't direct you. So my problem is, once you're on the naughty list, how do you get off? Once, you're, once you've dis been decided you're bad, how do you become unbad? <laughs> Even when, you've decide, even when you've done everything you can. Now, here's the thing. Everything is about compliance now. We've gotten rid of the cabaret law, thank God. But now everything is about, is that exit large enough? Is this that, is this that? These are things that are thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars putting small businesses out of business. <laughs> you guys don't want our tax money, our sales tax money? That's fine, because you're marching us out of business. Now, the, the city was talking about the fact that this actually only happens to a small percentage of things, and I don't know if it's a task force, a march raid, a nightlife task force, but there's something going on that nobody knows how to get in contact with and nobody knows how to stop, and that shouldn't happen in a democracy. I, I'm under the impression that this doesn't happen <laughs> to places that are chains, to places that are wealthy, to places in gentrified neighborhoods as often, or to people who have power. This seems to happen to artist-run spaces, places of color. I have a neighbor who doesn't like queer people. We happen to be a queer bar. She calls 311 all the time. Apparently that makes us bad people. So in a democracy, what do you do? Who do you call? I'm happy this is happening because really, like, I think a lot of us are at our wit's end as to who we can even contact to get off the march list. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Robert Bookman. I am counsel to the New York City Hospitality Alliance, the largest not-for-profit association representing thousands of restaurants and nightlife establishments throughout the five boroughs. Prior to that, I was counsel for 20 years to the predecessor, New York Nightlife Association. We were the organization that first started to work with the NYPD uh, 12, 13 years ago. And in addition to my law practice for over 30 years, I've represented thousands of nightlife establishments before state and city agencies, this council, and the courts. I have been intricately involved with this March issue for decades. The Hospitality Alliance wholeheartedly supports this common sense legislation. It will provide the needed transparency we have called for for over 20 years. Transparency to a process that remains controversial after all of these years and needs data and facts we can all share. We were very pleased to hear that the NYPD also supports this legislation. 
We value our ongoing communication and working relationship with the NYPD. Since 2006, when we began meeting with them regularly at the encouragement of this council and former Speaker Quinn, we have made considerable progress on many fronts. We jointly wrote and published best practices for nightlife establishments in 2007 and two subsequent update editions in 2011 and 2018. Best practices has become a model used all over the country and the world. We together created the first of its kind active shooter training video geared to bars and clubs. We have jointly held numerous training sessions for nightlife security managers and owners. The NYPD Crime Prevention Unit has included working with nightlife establishments for the first time with free daytime visits to help reduce crime in and around nightlife establishments with practical help with security cameras, customer awareness signage, hooks for pocketbooks, things like that. This has resulted in over an 80% reduction in the number of summonses being issued to the industry today compared to before our meetings 13 years ago. But one area we still need to work on is March. And this legislation provides a statistical basis for that work. And by the way, while we are talking about March, there are really multiple ways that businesses can get multiple task forces you know, attacking them or, or coming at them. March is one of them, and I think there was a lot of data about that today, and will be more. I want to make sure your legislation covers there's a mayor's office unit that could also order, you know, and you don't know who it is that's coming. So I want to make sure this legislation covers all inspections by multiple agencies to a nightlife business so that we all can have the real data and share it, and, and we can then come to the right conclusions about whether this is really necessary anymore. We think it's a troubling vestige from a leftover prior era. Uh, it actually began in the ha right after the Happy Land fire in 1990, uh, where 87 people died in an illegal and unsafe club. That tragedy resulted in what was called the Social Club Task Force, which, which ultimately did locate and close down these unlicensed establishments. But as government does, after completing its work, rather than disbanding the task force, which was successful, Mayor Giuliani morphed it into March, which now, however, was tasked with going after licensed establishments, not the illegal, underground, no liquor license social clubs. These are two very different types of businesses, however. One was illegal and underground. The other, that you're hearing from owners today, are open to the public. They're licensed. They're easy to contact the owners. The methodology may have made sense for the former illegal social clubs, but it, does, it did not and does not for the latter. As an enforcement tool, I do not think it's effective in advancing the underlying problems that agencies might have with a particular establishment. Yet, and, and I'll explain, you know, it, 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 why. In my experience, when, when a location is marched, whatever the underlying reasons are, they are not addressed by coming in at 12 o'clock at night with all these other agencies. They're not finding sales to minors. They're not going to happen to walk upon uh, a fight, you know, it's, you know coincidentally. Um, it has been historically, in my opinion, a, a waste of resources. Uh, I think the agencies that go to these with them bl believe it's a waste of resources. Uh, the health department was taken out of the march as a result of uh, our meetings with the NYPD over the years saying that they're coming during the day. They certainly don't need to be at march, and we haven't seen them for the most part in march. Uh, it is not my experience uh, that as a result of a march you get zero summonses, quite the opposite. Uh, it is my experience that you get a, uh, a package of summonses you know, as a result of a march, most of which can be accomplished during the daytime. I'll, I'll wrap up. There have been improvements, however, even in March. I do want to put a historical perspective here. When we started, uh, actually back in 2002, over 700 establishments were visited in a year. We're talking about 200 or so establishments today. And I don't know if all those processes are, are being used, but if they are, it, you know, it, it is a good, it is a good uh, start. And just in concluding, uh, Mr. Chairman, I like your idea in your last question that you asked, that now that we have a mayor's office of nightlife and a nightlife mayor, this seems an ideal position 
to add to that protocol that if they're not getting anywhere with a particular location, they bring in the mayor's office of nightlife, sit the parties down, mediate to find out what the real problem is, let's address the real problem so we don't have to waste a bunch of resources at night. Thank and, you. Well, I'm, I'm glad that I thought of that idea. I'm glad you did too. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marva Babel Tucker, and I'm the owner of O to Babel in Brooklyn, New York, on Prospect Heights. I'd like to bring O to Babel to the forefront of the damage raid marches can do to a small business. I opened O to Babel three years ago with my twin sister, Miriam. We launched with very little savings and literally some of our 401k with the idea of opening a communal space in our neighborhood. As a native Brooklynite, we lived in Crown Heights, Prospect Heights for over 30 years. We saw our friends and neighbors leave the community because of the effects of gentrification. With those changes, the, Bro the Brooklyn that we've known all our lives were also changing. The neighborhood spots were closing and being replaced with owners and patrons that did not reflect the neighborhood I grew up in. Miriam and I decided to bring back our Brooklyn by opening a safe space to enjoy and literally live out loud we opened Ode to Babel. Our space has grown organically over the three years and we have garnered lots of regulars and new patrons daily. We enjoy music, dancing, and a culmination of people of color, including our LGBT PLC community converging in good spirit, beautiful and peacefully. Our popularity has translated into disdain by some of our neighbors, neighbors that are new to the community and frankly would prefer to see us silenced literally and figuratively. The, con congregating, the congregating of black and brown bodies and the energy of the LGBT community does not fit well with the image they literally bought into. They want us to be quiet, closed, and unseen into other neighborhoods that they don't really care about. The fight and their weapon of choice is 311 and 911 calls to bombard, to bombard the board with complaints and pressure. As a person of color, I don't need to go into the dangers of using police presence as a weapon against other people of color, but this is exactly what is being done. On October 20th, our venue was marched. Our cozy 750 square foot lounge bar full of wonderful patrons dancing on a Friday evening became interrupted with 50 officers in full riot gear and various agencies ranging from NYPD, the DOH, and the SLA, and every agency in between, marched through our 750 square foot bar. 30 agents inside and another 20 agents and officers standing outside in front of our, of our venue. We were a spectacle. A visual that could tarnish the reputation of a small business because of assumptions that could be made by a passerby both walking driving or looking out of their window. Patrons that would never step foot into our small establishment as we try to continue to grow. A, spectac a spectacle that have been interpreted and could be concluded to be some in insidious illegal activity, but of course it was not. It was a standard harmless raid. As our loyal patrons stood in disbelief as officers asked the music to stop, our patrons continued to dance in silence, but with defiance and support of Ode to Babel. As agents scurried throughout our venue, drafting up tickets, which are financial things that hurt my small business, but was necessary to validate their visit. I waited for the march to end, and finally, when it did, I, find I received a multitude of fines that I fought and were dismissed. The raid had come and gone, but the financial burden, the mental stress, and distress for me as a small owner and a mother with small children that literally live directly above my bar has remained. The march must end. And to continue on, just to answer um, a point you made earlier today, I am kind of, kind of appalled that out of 57 marches that my small 750 square foot space was literally marched on. It's kind of hurtful that it's 12,000 establishments and they chose my bar. And I know a lot of the other, including the people here, are predominantly people of color bars patrons. And how come we are the ones sitting here in front and these are the type of bars that are being targeted? It, we don't have to act like that's not true. 
it's completely true and accurate. And I know other bar owners who are experiencing marching raids, raids so it's not a coincidence. Okay. Thank you very much. I know that Council Member um, Levin has questions for you. Um, this is for the two business owners that have experienced um, I don't. I don't know, if Rachel. You've also experienced March, but I, I guess I'm not officially a March. Okay. Uh, do you do you have any sense of of what other than just uh, neighbors that three one one complains about noise or three one one complains about people outside? Do you have any sense of why why your establishments landed on this list or I mean? It, I do. So the first time we actually pulled the 311 records because they said, do you have 311 calls? We had zero. We had increased 311 calls in the area, but there was another bar that opened that was not compliant with it. They're not, they don't care about the community, but that's their issue. So there was nothing that said friends and lovers is making too much noise. The place is completely soundproof. Like the DP came and they said, holy cow, I can't hear anything from the street. So I know that, that I called BS on it. The second time, we had an increased amount of theft. Um, again, another bar is bringing a different type of clientele. So we had four wallets stolen in the course of, of three months. The last time he said, the, the, we had one more report last week, so I couldn't ignore this. That's why we're here, but don't worry, we'll be fast. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have that report. He said it happened Wednesday. Sorry, that was my birthday party. I don't know any of my friends did not lose their wallet. I'd like to see this report. Fast forward two weeks later, no report. But yes, increased amount of theft was the trigger for the second time. Um, for us, I can, I honestly know for a fact that was one particular neighbor that is this another business that um, has said to us, you, we do not like your business and we won't, don't want you here. So I know that they are the ones who are using 311 because we've been here for three years and the complaints since they've opened this past summer has come out of, it's like have just multi, been multitude and just, it's just, I know for a fact it's specific, but it's, they know that they can close us down by what, by what they're doing. So um, that's one and um, I know people wait for Uber. I really can't tell people to not wait for Uber in front of this space. And that's Which is fairly, you know, normal it is very course normal. of business for a, an establishment yes. that's open at night. Exactly. I mean, it's the, the, it, 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 I'm sorry that this has happened to your businesses. I, I hope that your businesses, you know, are able to, move, you know, get by and move past this and, and uh, continue to thrive. Um, and certainly consider my office a resource and I'll coordinate with the Office of the Nightlife. Um, um, but, uh, you know, we, we greatly appreciate you being here and telling your stories because you're putting yourself out there. Um, and, um, and so that, that, that takes courage. And so I want to thank you for doing that. And, um, and we look forward to continuing to work with you guys on not only getting this bill passed, but, but hopefully uh, more efforts in that regard. So thank you. May we, may we add one thing for the record? So NYPD asked uh, repeatedly that, uh, you know, the data that we had, the NY that New York City Artists Coalition, our data is their data. <laughs> they gave us that data. It is scrambled, but we made it available right away. So there is a link we already shared with council. We're happy to share with anybody else. And we're gonna give you more details later. But if they're disputing that, they're disputing themselves. Apparently they don't know what they're doing. They weren't able to answer many of your specific questions. So let's do this bill and then let's move forward. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Folks, we're just going to take a two minute pause.
Um, next panel, Mr. Weaver from the Artist Coalition, Mr. Muchmore, Mr. Barkley, Ms. Pelly, uh, Jamie Burkhart, Alan Sugarman, and Tara McManus. Thank you. All right, if you all raise your right hand, get sworn in, we can get, get started. You swear a firm testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Good. Um, we're going to put two minutes on the clock, and um, unless anyone objects, we'll just start from my right and, and work our way around the table. How's that? Great. So, sir, you're up. Um, uh, start with stating your name. My name is Patrick Weaver, but I am reading testimony written by Brian Abelson. Um, it's pretty long, so I'm going to try to get through important parts of it, but I've submitted written testimony. Uh, my name is Brian Abelson, and I live in City Council District 34. On June 6, 2017, I filed a series of Freedom of Information requests seeking data on March raids. The text of these inquiries are publicly available online via MuckRock. Uh, there's a URL there, a service I used for managing these requests. Un Unsure of which agency to solicit information from, I sent the same letter to NYPD, FDNY, Department of Housing, Department of Buildings, and SLA. FDNY, DOH re rejected my request, each stating that the documents I requested were in NYPD's possession. Similarly, SLA responded saying that they were not in possession of relevant documents or that they would be able, unable to access them. The DOB has acknowledged my request and indicated on January 8, 2018 that they, were, that they were working on it but have not produced any documents, despite reminders I've sent every two weeks since then. On March 3rd, 2018, the NYPD responded to my letter with two documents. The first is a PDF entitled Criteria for Selecting a Location into the Multi-Agency Response to Community Hotspots Operation. The document has previously been reported on by the journalist Liz Pelley of The Baffler, who published a story on March, February 12th, 2018. The second is a spreadsheet entitled Copy of March Program 3. My testimony will focus primarily on the data contained in the spreadsheet and the knowledge I gleaned from it. The spreadsheet contains 2,300 rows which, with columns for the addresses of an inspection, inspection date, environmental control board, and DOB violation numbers, and a column named Access 1, which seems to indicate the outcome of the inspection, though I can't be sure since the NYPD did not respond to my follow-up request for additional details on its meaning. Importantly, the spreadsheet does not represent a list of inspections, but a list of violations that res resulted from inspections. That being said, in the case that no violations resulted from an inspection, there is a single row containing just the address of the inspection, the inspection date. Listen, we have the written testimony, right? Yep. That's good. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Tara McManus. I've been living in Brooklyn and making art for 18 years. I've lived in lofts, I've partied in warehouses, and I work in nightclubs that are all gone because of raids. I don't know which ones are March raids, but in all the cases, it was at least the fire department and the police department storming in. Um, some were legal licensed bars, some have been artist housing where we throw parties. The one thing they have in common is the element of surprise. When you're at a club on a Saturday night, you don't expect firefighters and police officers barging in with flashlights, illeg illegally searching my purse. Um, it incites panic. You would think that there is a fire or violent crime. I've seen bars empty so fast when they see uniforms. I've seen bartenders, door people, food vendors, all arrested. I've seen vent patrons arrested for standing too close to the bar. Um, where is the fire? Where is the emergency? Storming a venue on a busy night and making hasty arrests is as dangerous as yelling fire in a crowded theater. Um, is it worth creating a stampede to arrest a bartender working? 
I've helped dozens of artists deal with evictions. Um, they wake up to firefighters brandishing axes, making threats to use it at their doorstep. I've helped them pack their entire lives into storage units. They have three days during business hours to get out of their artist lofts. Um, the authorities come completely prepared, but we're not. They're ready to make arrests. They have their fines. They've done their research through our social media. They know the violations already. Some pay to get in, pay for drinks, and then break out their badges. Some come in through the fire exits using vital fire and life safety uh, procedures to come in through the back door. Um, while we're coming together to share our art with people and commune to live our lives and to work jobs, we have no idea. Why not let spaces they, that have violations let them know? My name's Jamie Burkhart. I'm a member of the New York City Artist Coalition. I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of the city's cultural communities to ask for talks, not raids. We need transparency on the multi-agency response to community hotspots, march raids in NYC that shutter beloved, diverse neighborhood cultural spaces. We are the city that gave birth to the Velvet Underground, Nobel Laureate Bob Dylan, Mambo, and Hip Hop. My life as an advocate began with the, began with the loss of another. My friend Nick Gomez Hall was one of the 36 people killed in Oakland's ghost ship tragedy. From the minute I heard he was gone, I knew that they were all gone. I was filled with shock and then grief. Our response was safety. We facilitated fire safety walkthroughs and workshops. Our study groups for the fire department's FD fire, uh, fire guard certification had an 100% exam pass rate. We advocated and created the New York City Office of Nightlife to support small, diverse cultural spaces. March raids in New York City are a legacy of Mayor Rudy Giuliani and are not relevant today. Giuliani's march raids were used in tandem with the discriminatory 1926 No Dancing Cabaret Law to shut down diverse culture. When you shut down small cultural spaces working to operate safely and in compliance, you force New Yorkers underground into ill-fitting environments, prevent this, and save lives. A single, in, a, in a single march raid, as many as 40 armed agents representing six New York City agencies and the State Liquor Authority storm a small business in SWAT-like gear at peak operating hours to traumatize customers, maximize fines, and force diverse neighborhood spaces out. The fallout is loss of jobs, dreams, more empty storefronts, and a painful signal to New York's emerging and newly arrived cultural communities that you are not welcome here. The shutdown of every space is a grave and egregious loss. NYPD Operations Order Number 27 from 2014 about March Raid states, do not alert patrons affiliated with the establishment, its patrons, or community members of the ongoing investigation operation. If you see something, say something. Provide support. Don't keep it secret. We need civil discourse, not night raids. Will the Office of Nightlife testify today? Use the Office of Nightlife with the New York City Artists Coalition as liaisons and cultural establishments. Inform spaces of problems so we can solve them. Thank you. My name is Andrew Muchmore. I operate a small bar and music venue in Williamsburg, and I also operate a law firm in Williamsburg that caters in part to hospitality clients. Uh, I believe the purpose of March is worthwhile, but there's a serious problem with proportionality and oversight. Uh, there effectively is no oversight because it's a multi-agency body, and having scores of uh, uniformed officers swarm on a small establishment is extremely disproportionate. Uh, the council should understand that the cost of such raid for some of these smaller establishments, especially ones that are run by artists or nonprofit organizations, can be catastrophic. The administrative code is so complex that if you send a dozen enforcement officers in from different agencies, they'll be able to write enough summons for almost any establishment to put it out of business. Uh, it, the health code is inordinately complex. I've always had an A in my own establishment, yet every year we have to pay more than $1,000 in fines. The zoning resolution is particularly problematic. The, uh, you know, dancing was previously prohibited in most of the city, and the description of any place on its certificate of occupancy will never fully describe everything that takes place in it. For instance, there is no zoning category or use group for legislative chamber. So if, if you're in a room, that, first of all, there are no rooms that have only a single purpose. Uh, every room is used for lots of purposes, but if you do not exactly comply with your certificate of occupancy, that can be a basis for fines that are catastrophically expensive to correct because you also have to hire an architect and go through the Department of Buildings. You have accessory uses, but the Department of Buildings keeps changing its interpretation of what it considers an accessory use. I have a client that recently was forced to close their nightlife establishment in Williamsburg for a number of reasons, but one issue that they had experienced was the Department of Buildings decided that it was no longer an accessory use to allow the consumption of food and alcohol outdoors if the in an area that it can legally be occupied in conjunction 
with the bar and restaurant business. They decided it was now a primary use and what was previously permitted under the certificate of occupancy was no longer permitted. If you look at the index of uses in the zoning resolution, they're simply too complex for people to realistically comply with and common sense is required in the enforcement. Is Mayor, Governor Cuomo recently cited uh, the example of a lemonade stand that was shut down by the Department of Health and a seven-year-old boy trying to sell lemonade for a quarter. Uh, some, some logic has to be used in enforcing these laws and I think coordination with the Office of Nightlife would be very helpful in ensuring that uh, March does not exceed uh, rational bounds of, of necessary enforcement. It's like death, <clears throat> it's the Grim Reaper. It's a gotcha kind of thing. It's the end for any venue that it happens to. It's an economic hit, it doesn't make sense, it's unpredictable, it's SWAT-like, it makes people feel afraid, it's censorship. These are just some of the ways that the March Task Force and its operations have been described to me by New York City musicians, venue staff, and other local business owners. My name is Liz Pelly, I'm a journalist, and for the past decade, I've been writing about music and culture. I'm also a participant in, New York City's, participant in New York City's music communities. From 2014 to 2018, I was a collective member at the Silent Barn, the long-running artist-run venue that shuttered this past May. While I was involved in the Silent Barn, I became familiar with the concept of the March program. The barn existed in two different locations over the years, and the original building was in fact shut down by a March raid in 2011. Many individuals involved in running independent venues in New York City are familiar with March to some extent. It's part of the vocabulary of running a venue here. But its inner workings are obscure even to many of the venues the task force threatens. Its mystified style of enforcement keeps venues and business owners living in perpetual fear, and most known information about the March operations is anecdotal or pieced together from firsthand experience. In 2017, I decided I'd like to learn more about this opaque, secretive task force and write an article about it. I spoke with members of communities and also filed freedom of information law requests, receiving back a 2014 operations order that shed the smallest beam of light on these complicated raids. I was struck by the extent to which these raids prioritize secrecy over productive conversation. Quote, do not alert persons affiliated with the establishment, its patrons, or community members to ongoing investigations and operations, the procedure urges community affairs officers visiting venues. I've learned that resistance to conversation with communities is a continued pattern when it comes to these operations. The secret nature of the task force means that venues may not know whether they're being raided by March, nor neighbors aware of the gravity of their 311 complaints. I just have a little bit more. One Brooklyn venue, music venue employee recalled a multi-agency visit. The cops claimed to be doing a business investigation. A plainclothes cop made his way behind the bar. Uniformed officers checked the IDs of everyone there, looking for underage drinkers. drinkers. Uh, someone from the FDNY investigated the whole place. Quote, we were pretty much up to code, and yet all their customers were leaving one by one. As it turned out, a new neighbor had been calling 311 to make noise complaints. Noise complaints are listed in an official Music in New York City report from 2017, which cites them as a growing reason for the shuttering of venues. In the past 15 years, more than 20% of New York City's smaller venues have closed, the report states. When we asked why they were there, they didn't even seem to know the rhetoric they were supposed to use, the music venue staffer told me. They were very much trying to not give us information about what they were doing. Um, and I'll skip to the end. A lot of this is from an article that I wrote that was published last year that is online if anyone wants to read it. <clears throat> In today's increasing isola increasingly isolated culture, music is a rare medium that still has the power to get individuals into rooms together to share ideas, collaborate, sing, dance, emote, or be in space with other humans. Protecting the power of music from commodification and exploitation means securing the ability for strong local communities to form from the ground up and creating resources for longstanding NYC artists. Here on the ground in New York, that starts with protecting the independent cultural spaces and local businesses. Instead, the March program has historically treated artists and local business owners like criminals instead of encouraging safety. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. If this is an article, you can... This is the last sentence. Okay. Transparency is a step in the right direction, but let's also consider something more. Getting rid of March raids altogether and replacing it with programs that would truly promote safety, conversation, community, and culture. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is John Barclay. I operate a bar in Brooklyn. I'm also a co-founder of the Dance Liberation Network, an organization that uh, helped repeal the uh, New York City cabaret law. 
I want to use my time right now to address some of the things that the uh, uh, gentleman from the NYPD, some of the claims he made. The first uh, is in regards to the style of these visits, or as most of us call them, uh, raids. It's super intense. It looks like a uh, like a uh, like a counter like a federal counterterrorism raid. There's a, you know dozens of people come in. Uh, they come in quick. They shine flashlights in everyone's faces. Music's off. Lights are up all the way. Uh, it's uh, it's very confusing and uh, it's also uh, terrifying. It looks like a, a Steven Seagal movie or something. Um, something else I'd like to uh, bring up is he uh, characterized it as a tool of last resort and said that uh, you know businesses uh, are given a chance uh, ahead of time to correct whatever perceived problem there is. I, I've been visited by, uh, I've been raided by March and of course I was not uh, informed of uh, any wrongdoing be, uh, before this happened. And uh, in my experience, everyone I've talked to has a uh, similar story. Um, Another thing is, uh, if you just, I just don't think this is how law enforcement is supposed to work. If you take uh, the logic of the uh, March task force and you apply it to uh, an entity that's non-nightlife or just, uh, you know, in a, a private individual, uh, it really sort of highlights the absurdity because we're all breaking laws to, oh, well, that was quick. All right, I'm submitting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alan Sugarman. I'm an attorney here in the city. Uh, I would like the opportunity to file a written statement in the next week or so. Absolutely, we appreciate that. And, and okay, so quickly, I'll use my couple of minutes. My first thought was to abolish March, uh, but that, I ran into a problem there. I couldn't find any official document showing that it had actually been established. Your proposed legislation talks about, A, the office shall submit, and it refers to the multi-agency response to community hotspots. After diligent search of the city uh, website and Google publicly, it's, there's no document that shows that it was ever established. There are no guidelines, there are no policies, there's nothing. Mayor Giuliani, probably the most authoritarian mayor we have ever had, his effort should not be the model of what we do here in 2019. Um, and I think it should be abolished, and if the mayor wishes to reestablish it or the city council, let's reestablish it with a proper declaration and a proper amendment of the, of the uh, city laws and the city rules and regulations. This is really absurd. Quickly, first I'd like to thank Mr. Muchmore, who's here today, for his efforts that led to the ending of the cabaret law. But the cabaret law is really in effect today in another way, through the zoning regulation. And I assume because, unless you're in use group 12, I'm oversimplifying, you can't have dancing. And if you can't have dancing and it doesn't show up on your certificate of, of public um, assembly, you could be cited by March. So March is still fully enabled to do a lot of other stuff elsewhere in the city. So just a couple of uh, specific suggestions. There should be central reporting of what the March records. It, should be the cent it shouldn't be on a precinct by precinct. All the records should go centrally. They should be required to videotape all the raids and their body cams should be kept. The, the record report should include the name of every single participant in the raid, the name, agency, serial number, et cetera. And some people should create a standard form. But I think it should be abolished, then recreated, and it should, uh, they should uh, report to the Nightlife Commission, and there should be no raids unless approved by the Nightlife Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you know, we have from the FOIL request, um, the FOIL response, the NYPD operations order, number 27, issued on July 11, 2014, which you know, is now a public document. It's, it's out there. 
And it doesn't establish an, an office, it just describes criteria for selecting a location for inclusion into the multi-agency response to community hotspots march operation. So just, this is. I did not submit a FOIL, I just did a search on nyc.gov. But this was created in 1998, that appears in the records, and it was created by Mayor Giuliani. There's no document showing the establishment of this agency. In fact, it was once called the multiple. Yeah. Well, my, my, I'm, my point is, um, this is available now. Um, if I FOIL. Well, the, this is FOIL from the New York Artists Coalition, right? No, that's from my articles. It's from you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you've got this. Yes. We'll share it with them. And we're going to make it part of our record, and when it goes online, it will be visible in that way. I'm just curious for the, um, the, the idea that um, these march operations should be, uh, the officers should have their body cams on. Just, just how do the, the, the owners of the establishments feel about that? Because then your, your patrons are going to be on the video. Do you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, grab it. I think it's a good idea. I think that uh, people tend to behave better when they're being watched, and I would feel more comfortable with those officers having their cameras on. Yes. I also feel it would be a good idea. I think if anyone uh, saw how intense uh, and absurd this was, that you guys would abolish it immediately. Mm. Okay. Anyone would have any objection to that, to it being videotaped? No. Okay. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our hearing.